afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you very much for coming to the latest of our talks in what we're branding as Family History 100 to mark 100 years of Pronies' existence. So Danny's guest has come over from Bristol, um, Dr. Colin Chapman, who's the Vice President of the Family History Federation, um, which is an umbrella organization that has about 165 family history societies. Um, and Colin's going to give us his insights um, about the Federation, what they do, uh, how they do it, etc. Cetera, et cetera. So I'd just like to remind you that there's one more talk in this series, and that will be tomorrow. And that's going to be by four different speakers. Uh, and it kind of brings everything we've been talking about to, this week together, because there's four projects we'll cover. Things like area and surname. So each of the projects is very much a, a, a very it's a small project and has involved big scales of transcriptions and indexing. Um, before I ask Colin to speak, you, you, anybody who's been here for the last couple of days knows what I'm going to say now. Uh, please set your phones off um, onto silent. Um, with no park, no parking. Everywhere outside is pay and display. And there's no planned fire evacuation. If a fire event happens, just we we um we we we, we cross the road, and um we meet up outside the arc apartments. And finally, that this is one of the many events that we have over the course of the year. Details can be found on the Pony Express, which you can sign up to, or on the Pony website. So it's my pleasure to ask Colin to come and speak to us all. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and uh, it's good to um, be, I was going to say, back in, in Belfast. I was last here in 1971, <laughs> so I'm, and prior to then it was 1950-something, um, and I don't remember much about either. Uh, <coughs> So I've, I've travelled quite a bit uh, in conjunction with my family history, um, but it's a great pleasure to, to come here and share a few ideas uh, with yourselves today. <clears throat> you can see from the uh, sort of the logo sort of splashed across the middle of, of, of this that we got uh, <clears throat> 1974 uh, and 2024 there. It decides. <clears throat> Prone is 100 years, it's the Federation's 50 years um, this year. I wasn't involved at the meetings in 1974, but I have been at every annual general meeting since the first one in uh, 1975. <clears throat> so I reckon I do know a little bit uh, about the Federation itself, <clears throat> and I've had whole various uh, positions within the, the Federation, a totally uh, volunteer uh, organisation, it's the umbrella <coughs> uh, for family history societies uh, around the world, people who are interested uh, in routes somewhere within the British Isles. <coughs> so that's the sort of the, the remit um, of the Federation itself. Perhaps just to tell you that I have been dabbling in family history since I was six years old. Mm. I was very fortunate <coughs> being a nosy little child uh, that I went rummaging in the uh, parents of my father, so the uh, paternal grandparents' attic and I found a family Bible. I opened the family Bible uh, and there were some names in there that meant nothing to me at all. I'd never heard of any of these. And I took the family Bible down to my grandparents and said, you know, who, who are these people? And both my grandfather and my grandmother, and it was her grandparents who were in this Bible. Uh, and they started to tell me about the stories of their childhood and their memories. And they were talking about, and this was a village on the Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire 
Buckinghamshire border, right at the corner of those three counties. And they were telling me that <clears throat> the stories of the nearest railway station uh, was about eight, nine miles away. And the horse-drawn bus used to collect the passengers in their childhood uh, and take them to this village. And <clears throat> my grandfather was saying how uh, at the bottom of the hill all the passengers had to get out of the bus while the horse took the, uh, uh, the, the bus to the top of the hill and then all the passengers got back in. Whether that was true, I have no idea. Uh, but it fired my childhood imagination and I immediately <coughs> copied out the names from the Bible transcription, <laughs> as we call it now, but I was copying them out. Um, we were at school doing something about kings and queens and having to learn William I, William II, William the, and, 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 and so on, to, to learn the whole lot by rote. Um, and I drew up a, a pedigree chart of my, or these people in, in this family Bible, and luckily, I never throw anything away. And I have got those original notes I made as a six-year-old. <clears throat> I hid them from my parents. My mother was very good at not throwing things away. <clears throat> uh, at throwing things away, sorry. Uh, but I hid them in their attic. And then I went on to do O-levels and A-levels and universities and things. And then I, I came back to uh, family history and I <coughs> said to my parents, have you still got those notes? And my mother said, well, if we have, they're in our attic and I'm not going up there. Uh, so I found them. So I've got my original notes, as I said, made as a, uh, as a six-year-old. Um, and I've been building on the family history ever since. I was encouraged in the meantime, and I dabbled. Uh, as a child, um, but I have been very successful in finding my ancestors uh, and also with the support of family history societies uh, ha have in fact built out and developed family history as opposed to just the family trees. So let me see if I can find out the right buttons to press here. Um, and <clears throat> the purposes of the Family History Federation, which, as I said, got going in 1974, and there were about 10 societies in existence at that time. <clears throat> and <clears throat> they got together and said, well, we don't all want to be reinventing the wheel, so let's pull our ideas and they came up with this idea as I've got on the screen here to promote, encourage and foster the study of family history, genealogy and heraldry and at that time um, family history and genealogy were almost two quite separate arts or sciences depending on how you look at it Genealogy was people just sticking together a pedigree chart and family history was finding out something about what the people did. How did they look? What trades were they engaged in? What clothes did they wear? What sort of houses did they live in? But I think today that there is very little distinction uh, between what genealogists are doing and, and what family historians are doing. <clears throat> and some people still can't pronounce genealogy. They call it genealogy. Um, so I think you're safer to talk about family history. Uh, and of course, heraldry, a lot of people rather, um, well, some of the people involved with heraldry were a bit snooty that they had a coat of arms or, uh, to, to be correct, an armorial achievement. Uh, and um, they, they thought, well, perhaps their vassals, their servants, uh, may have uh, tagged along, but uh, heraldry was regarded as a rather superior side of, of things. <clears throat> but I actually find it very useful because you can track 
the people who were the servants, who were the tenants on, shall we say, the manors, where in fact the people who were entitled to display a coat of arms, <coughs> they may well have moved quite a long way, <coughs> maybe uh, to, to Ireland from, from England and Wales, or, or from one end um, of Britain to, to the other end, taking with them some of their uh, tenants and, and, and uh, followers, shall we say. So actually I find heraldry quite useful in tracking the working classes of, of years gone by. So anyway, <coughs> the societies got together and they said that they were interested in sort of swapping ideas and so they set up the federation, or I must confess, I, I was involved, we set up the federation as an umbrella organisation, so to support the societies and the members of the societies and the family history community on a wider basis. And the idea was to promote the preservation, the security, and the accessibility of archive material. And this has been a, an uphill struggle as well over the years because in some cases, some archives, some records were held in private hands and were virtually inaccessible. Uh, and we're sort of very keen on making the material available and persuading the owners or the custodians of fairly inaccessible material. Uh, and to make sure that it is preserved, uh, <coughs> conserved professionally, with people that know what they're doing and not sticking things together uh, with sellotape or uh, gum uh, and putting things uh, in plastic envelopes that are not of archival quality. So we believe that we are sort of trying to preserve the past for future generations and this has been very important in fact in the last week and in fact it ends today i don't know if any of you have got ancestors uh, from uh, england and wales and you're interested in wills <coughs> but if you are the uh, department of justice the government uh, has come up with an idea that they're going to destroy all wills from 1858 in England and Wales. Uh, they're going to digitize them first uh, and they're going to keep one or two of famous people, but they're going to destroy the rest. And um, we are absolutely up in arms about this. <coughs> uh, um, there's been petitions um, and today is the last day of people's opportunity to send an email to the justices Justice, the Department of Justice, the government department that's come up with this bright idea, um, uh, to just to point out um, that just because something's digitised today doesn't mean to say you can read it in five years' time because the software, the technology might not be available. When somebody is filming material to digitise it, they miss pages. Uh, and uh, if somebody breaks into the system, I don't know if any of you have heard about the British Library, uh, that, where in fact their software system was hacked. And they have actually had to pay millions of pounds, mm -hmm. millions of pounds they've had to get to be able to make the whole of the British Library available again. So scammers have got into that system, they've held the British Library to ransom, and it's cost, as I said, millions of pounds to be able to open it up again so that people can read and get access, and even get access to the catalogues. So digitizing probate material could go down the same way and so nobody will have access uh, to the um, wills from 1858 until 
um, about 1980 or something like that. <laughs> so if you are bored this evening and you've got access <laughs> to a laptop, do send uh, an email and, and say, it's not a very good idea. <laughs> so, the Family History Federation, um, it was originally called the Federation of Family History Societies, uh, but it just rebranded itself a few years ago. Uh, and on the left at the top there, you've got the original armorial achievement of the Federation of Family History Societies, and then on the right, um, on, on the left hand side uh, you've got the, the logo today but the, the buzzwords really are cooperation between societies coordination of the transcription work and the help they're providing for their members um, support you know, strength is in numbers and the umbrella organisation can provide ideas to the member societies there's legal advice which is available things such as copyright um, and this is a very tricky business and not very well understood by many societies and certainly many individuals they think oh well i can make a copy of this particular record uh, and i'm going to write a little history of my family um, and i'll include a copy from this particular archive of the record they may well be breaking copyright and could then be getting themselves into financial trouble uh, as, as well and certainly somebody giving a lecture <coughs> such as this to a family history society if they're showing some original records they may well have permission from the original archive to show it to that audience because it's regarded as an educational project, a lecture. If in fact that lecture is recorded and then shown to all the members of the public, that society could be in breach of copyright from the original holder of the archive and they could find up that they're um, ending up w w with a big bill that they just hadn't thought about. They think that because they've copied something from an archive, haven't got permission or haven't necessarily paid a copyright fee, which some archives may require, <coughs> um, and the lecturer is, is fine because they've got permission for a, as I said, a, an educational project. <coughs> But if the society is then passing that on, they are publishing it and breaking copyright. So legal advice from the Federation, from the umbrella organisation, to societies on to how to proceed under those sort of circumstances. <coughs> and the other thing is insurance. If a society is holding a meeting in a, a village hall, shall we say, or a, a grand building, <coughs> they may well uh, require some sort of insurance. If they're out on a project crawling around gravestones and somebody uh, pokes a pencil in somebody else's eye as they're with exciting copying off the inscriptions, or if a tombstone falls on them, uh, they may well be advised very much so uh, to uh, take out some sort of insurance and the Federation can advise uh, on how to do that and how to proceed and even provide um, uh, it, 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 it's now part of the uh, fee that a society pays to join the Federation they are automatically covered by certain aspects of insurance <coughs> when I made this slide at the beginning of the week, well, on Sunday, there were 162 members, but the executive held a, uh, another meeting um, uh, on Monday, um, and, and you, you heard the latest uh, number just, just, just now. So we, it's, it's up. It, it's about 165 uh, at the moment. And that's uh, 120 
ordinary <coughs> members. They are ones throughout the British Isles. Um, and there's 10 associates. They are smaller organizations that don't have a formal constitution. <coughs> and family history is not necessarily their main function. They may be a local history society. Uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, or a parish society or something like that and there are 24 uh, overseas and that means out of the British Isles so Australia, New Zealand, Canada, United States uh, and, and, and spread around so that's the number of societies <coughs> uh, and there's about 66 and a half thousand members so the Federation itself is representing um, nearly, shall we say, 70,000 individuals who are interested uh, in finding something out uh, about their British Isles roots. The Federation <coughs> does produce a, a, a booklet, um, well, a sort of pamphlet in, in a booklet, here's one here, that's the front and back cover. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to leave this one with anybody that's interested. There's another one out on the uh, Family History Society desk out in the reception there. And in here um, is, is a little book for grandchildren to write their own family history to um, uh, help them produce a, a, a tree. And then what they call a really useful leaflet, <coughs> that's this which has got the name of every single one of those 165 uh, societies. So uh, you, you've got a list of the uh, n name, the address, uh, and the email ad address, uh, so the electronic address, uh, of each one of those societies. There's generally uh, at least one for every county uh, within Britain, uh, and some counties have got several and then there's some specialist societies uh, that are dealing with the particular Catholics, the, the Jewish um, and, and, and so on. <coughs> that booklet uh, is free, the leaflet is free uh, and if you want your own copy there's the email address uh, for that. that. So that is providing as I said the address of every society and putting the societies in touch with each other uh, and putting uh, individuals um, in touch with the societies if they've got a particular interest for a particular part of the British Isles or they want to know they've got maybe an ancestor in, in New Zealand um, and they're not too sure what to who to touch who to get in touch with um, then in fact it's on that leaflet as well of course uh, you can find these things on online um, if you really want to. The Umbrella Organisation also provides a monthly get-together um, online. Uh, Margaret Roberts is the, uh, she's from Cheshire, she's the Federation um, Officer uh, who in fact arranges these and this is really for um, people holding an office within a member society that maybe a treasurer wants to uh, share problems or successes uh, with the treasurer or treasurers of other societies. Uh, and a different topic is picked um, <coughs> every month. The one in February was on how do we go back to face-to-face -face meetings having had everything on Zoom during the lockdown. Uh, and here we got next month, it is going to be treasurers. <coughs> and then some ideas uh, in April uh, are on running um, uh, Zoom and hybrid mixture of Zoom and face-to-face. -face. Or for the, the chairs, the chairpersons, chairman, chairman, whatever you like to call the people that now chair a society. They're going to be swapping ideas in May, and then journal editors are swapping ideas in June. So you can see this is for 
the benefit of the people running the societies, the people who have been elected to their committee or their executive or whatever it's called, trustees of their board, called different things at different societies. <coughs> so you've got these um, various uh, specialist get-togethers um, which are uh, available uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, and one needs, the society needs to contact the admin side of the Federation offices uh, to be able to get the link to join in with those. But member societies are uh, sort of extremely welcome for those. Federation does have a website um, and what I've done is to do a mock-up here of the website uh, and to get into it it's just familyhistoryfederation.com um, and you've got these uh, five major buttons um, and I want to do is just take you through each of these uh, explaining a little bit about if you're on the website and you press these uh, what you will find and what, what uh, a little bit more about what the Federation is able to do for societies and for individuals uh, such as yourselves. So family history books. This is a, a, uh, a just a separate bit of the Federation but it's a sort of commercial wing owned by the Federation so any profit that is made on selling books from commercial publishers. So people like Pen and Sword or Philemore or any, any genealogical publishing organization or um, local history as, as well. <coughs> and they do publish family history books, publish them of their own titles relating to research. So as I said, they've got their <coughs> own um, website but you can get to it it's linked very easily and quickly from the Federation website so you can see what books are available and very often at least once a month uh, they have a special offer so it's worth keeping an eye on that so you can get something at a, a percentage off so that's back to the mock-up of, uh, of, uh, of the website Let's have a look at the next one, Parish Chest. This is a similar sort of thing, of an entity. Um, it's family history societies that have produced their own booklets, maybe transcriptions from a certain uh, parish register within their county. Uh, it could be copies of the tombstone inscriptions, the monumental inscriptions from the uh, Catholic chapel or the nonconformist chapel or maybe from the Anglican Church of England churchyard or from a cemetery in their area. <coughs> they have made these available through the parish chest so they are sold by the Federation on behalf of the society and the society uh, Get, gets it, it effectively the, the cash back through the parish chest system. So there's 50 of those 160 societies are making their materials available uh, and there are also uh, just over 20 uh, commercial traders who are also offering their wares through that. So do look through parish chest which is helping the societies um, and family history books, which is helping the, the individuals. And the sort of things that you can find available from parish chests are uh, parish register transcriptions, memorial inscriptions, non-conformist lists, some wills and probate lists, um, and various folders, um, and, and so, sort of uh, associated materials. Um, uh, acid-free uh, folders and, 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 and so on <coughs> and, and about sort of new things are coming to us every now and again so parish chest 
a Family History Federation service. So there is also, uh, looking at the middle circle there, subscribe to the newsletter or the bulletin, the really useful bulletin as it's called. So it's a monthly newsletter um, full of news, events, articles and featured societies. There's just over 20,000 individuals can subscribe uh, to that. <coughs> The February issue came out yesterday, or the day before, um, and past issues are also available. Um, and um, you can subscribe to that, so you can get this free every month with up-to-date information as what's going on in the family history world, some of it worldwide, um, but it's, as I said, produced um, by the Federation itself, who's concentrating on people finding their British Isles roots. So, uh, <clears throat> as I said, in every month there's a couple of societies say a little bit about themselves and what they're doing, what their latest projects are, what their plans are for the future. Um, as I said, and all you've got to do, um, you will get it absolutely free, emailed to you at home, uh, and all you've got to do is to contact admin at Family History Federation uh, and this will come tumbling into your inbox uh, without you having to do any more thinking about it at all. <clears throat> if you want to find a society there's another button on that website which you can find the societies um, alphabetically there's an A to Z list and in fact it's familyhistoryfederation.com forward slash societies hyphen a z a to z for the societies and it, they're also listed as a separate listing within that group of all the societies within the British Isles then there's a separate group of the uh, overseas societies and then of course there's a whole group of societies that are concentrating uh, on one particular surname uh, those that have joined specifically to the Federation you can find easily through that list and then there is the Guild of One Name Studies which is itself a member of the Federation and you can get uh, uh, into to that so <coughs> each society uh, has got its logo uh, and then a little blurb about it and I just for fun uh, picked off the logos of the societies that I'm personally involved in. So you've got the bottom left, the Bedfordshire Family History Society logo. I'm the patron of that. There's the Bristol and Avon Family History Societies, which I founded um, in the early 1970s. <coughs> um, and I'm now the uh, president of that. There's the Gloucestershire Family History Society. In the middle there, that's its logo with the uh, shape of Gloucestershire as the bushes of the leaves on the tree. Um, and I'm actually the president of that as well, and I founded that. And then, for your interests, although I haven't got any uh, Northern Ireland connections, I've put your logo uh, there. And then the right-hand side is the Northamptonshire Family History Society, which I uh, founded um, in 1976, well, refounded it in 1979. It, it collapsed a little bit in 78. Uh, but I brought that back together and I'm president of that one as well. So I'm kept fairly busy with these societies. Uh, <laughs> uh, asking for advice or asking me to go and talk to them um, or just sharing the, the, the fun. Uh, of family history. Most of my ancestry actually comes from Northamptonshire and a bit from Bedfordshire. Um, I have no ancestors at all from Bristol or Gloucestershire. I just happen to live in Gloucestershire and Bristol is only 30 miles down the road. Uh, <coughs> and uh, so I try to get to all their monthly meetings if I can. Uh, and there is also on that A to Z site uh, a map, so if you're not too sure where anywhere is, 
or where the society is, you can just click on that and you can see, ah, oh, that's where Shropshire is. <laughs> or, gosh, I didn't realise that Suffolk was next to Norfolk or whatever. I'm sure none of you are like that, but you talk to anybody under 21 <laughs> these days, and unless it's available on a sat nav, they don't care where it is. <laughs> And then there's a directory of speakers, <coughs> and <coughs> you can go into there um, and you can identify from there what topics they talk about. Do they do live talks and online talks, or only live, or only Zoom? Um, what's their availability? Will they, if they're living in Folkestone, will they travel uh, to North Wales? Um, or whatever, and are they available obviously on a particular time? How much are they going to charge um, for their uh, giving a talk? Do they charge extra for traveling? Which of course doesn't count if you have an online talk. Uh, and how to get hold of them? Telephone number, email address, postal address. <coughs> so again, if you're interested in finding speakers and they're on that list of approved speakers from the uh, Federation and they can get onto that uh, by being recommended uh, by uh, two or three societies. Um, uh, but of course the Federation takes no responsibility if you invite somebody um, and it's a gorgeous success or a <laughs> I'm sure nobody ever comes up as a failure. Uh, but uh, so it's recommended by fellow member societies. So a very good source of, of information uh, and a huge variety of, a huge spectrum of subject topics. There is a live family history show, they're called really useful shows. Um, there's a live one coming up on the 20th of April, if you're able to get over to Cambridgeshire. Well, actually, it's in the old Huntingdonshire. So if you're more familiar with the historic counties, um, th then in fact, it, it's in Huntingdon. <laughs> but I said, it's now in Cambridgeshire with a postcode of Peterborough, which is never sure whether it's in Northamptonshire, Huntingdonshire, or Cambridgeshire. <laughs> so, so uh, Anyway, if you're able to get over and want to see some real people uh, and, and rub shoulders with real people uh, rather than talking to a postage stamp size head, um, I can recommend going over to, 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 to that event. And there is a big online one in November, which um, uh, is taking place over two days. 15th and 16th of November, uh, and that's got a separate email address for the full details, so it's just fhf-reallyuseful.com. But again, you can pick, the, the, this is all stuff you can pick up from the Family History Federation website. I'm just taking you sort of behind some of the icons for you to see what's happening behind the scenes. <coughs> And then the Federation also encourages um, uh, and, and maybe funds and supports in some ways or provides practical help for a number of things and I've just used abbreviations there on the right hand side, NBI and tribunals. Let's just have a uh, look at that. Um, but I'll go into explore your genealogy um, before I do that one. So let's just look at the Explore Your Genealogy uh, button uh, first. This is a new uh, uh, venture where, in fact, this is not so much for the benefit of the societies, but for the benefit of individual family historians. There's a whole range of little uh, vignettes, um, podcasts, or whatever you like to call them these days, a little bit of information with lots of illustrations and descriptions about various aspects of uh, family history research. So there's a little bit. So there are buttons on the Explore Your Genealogy 
site, which as I said, you can get to from the Federation site. As you can see, there's something on parish registers, something on family heirlooms, DNA, which of course I know is very popular with yourselves, or military, or old handwriting, or maps and gazetteers, or newspapers, um, uh, education. So a whole lot of little, as I said, uh, presentations for you to find out a bit more about any one of those topics and you just sort of press a button and it opens up uh, a, a, a short presentation on all of those topics and there's new ones being added all the time. So that's explore your genealogy. <coughs> uh, <coughs> and um, so let me just mention these projects I mentioned to you just now. So there's the National Burials Index. A few years ago, the Federation was very conscious that the people were very easily made available through what is now Family Search of uh, baptisms or christenings uh, and marriages. But there was very little on a lot of sites in, in the early days uh, of burials. So the Federation set up a separate project looking at burials and providing an index <coughs> to burials and they were covering from 1538 through to 2008. <coughs> that is still available. Uh, th th we realised that in fact the First World War the tribunals that were set up because people by late 1915, early 1916, were less enthusiastic. At the very beginning of the First World War, you couldn't stop people joining up and coming forward and volunteering. And people falsified their ages, boys of 14, <coughs> 15 were saying that you know they are 18 years old uh, or 21 years old uh, so at the very beginning of the war there was no problem finding volunteers but as I said uh, 18 months in and people were less enamored uh, so conscription was introduced uh, and some people for genuine reasons, although very patriotic, had got a business to run, uh, a, a small private business, and they couldn't release every son uh, to join up to be able to survive. Uh, other people didn't want to join up. You had people for religious reasons who felt convinced that they shouldn't join up. So um, conscription was introduced um, and then people who were not either volunteering or had been compelled to join up, they were brought before a tribunal of local personalities, normally including some local magistrates, um, to say, you know, why haven't you joined up? Or your excuse is not valid, you must join up. Um, and for Middlesex, all the paperwork has survived. The government actually in the 1920s had required the paperwork for all the tribunals to be destroyed. They thought they don't want it and it's not necessary anymore. So, uh, but they decided to keep one lot for Scotland and one lot for England and Wales and Middlesex was chosen. The county archivist for Northamptonshire, <laughs> she was a lovely lady, she, she rebelled and she hid all the material mm -hmm. and it wasn't destroyed and it wasn't found again until during the Second World War she confessed that she had taken all this stuff home um, and, and had squirreled it away. 
So in fact, although officially it's only Middlesex that survived, which was survived purposely as an example, if, if you've got ancestors from Northamptonshire, you're, you're very lucky. And there are odd ones for various odd parishes or the odd town here and there, but generally uh, you can't find that. Anyway, the Federation has in fact put the, put the money, the funding forward uh, with some volunteers to index the Middlesex material. And similarly with the manorial records, you may well be aware that the, the, um, the Historical Manuscripts Commission were the original people that held the whereabouts of manorial records. They were in the top end of Chancery Lane, just down from the... Um, public record office when that was in uh, Chancery Lane uh, and they merged with the public record office when they moved to Kew and that's when they changed the name to the National Archives so it's the original manorial documents his, uh, manorial documents register uh, and the old public record office are now the National Archives um, and the um, revised index to that, and it's just the index which is held at the National Archives. Um, again, the Federation funded that work to do the revision. <coughs> and then for Lancashire, of the crew lists uh, for various ports in Lancashire, which may interest some of you because some of these people might be coming across uh, to uh, Northern Ireland on various uh, ventures. From 1863 to 1914, there's two or three series there, <coughs> and again the Federation in conjunction with the Manchester and Lancashire Society, as it was, that had started to do that project. Um, that's all been brought together and funded. So the Federation does and will continue. They did something for Gloucestershire, they made funding available for Gloucestershire Family History Society to do a project that they couldn't quite afford themselves, uh, the society, so there was funding and support uh, available for that. Just so that you know who is involved with this, um, our current president is Janet Few, um, and some of you may well have met her on various Zoom talks that she gives. <coughs> Then there are four life vice presidents. There's uh, me, there's Pauline Lytton, who was awarded an MBE for the work that she did in conjunction with family history. There's Derek Powergrave, and there's Lady Tebbiot, Lady Mary Terriot, whose husband, Lord Tebbiot, Charles Tebbiot, he's died fairly recently. So we're sort of honorary officers and they uh, consult us now and again, we're invited to the executive meetings. We don't have a vote um, uh, to want anything to do with policy, um, but they pick our brains. <laughs> uh, and then you've got an executive committee, all volunteers. The current chair uh, is Steve Manning, and he should be here today, not me, um, but he is having his hip operated on yesterday. Uh, so he didn't feel like leaping up from his hospital and catching a plane over and coming here for this morning. So he asked me to sort of uh, come in and do it. And so we've got a vice chair and education officer, treasurer, finance officer, publicity, DNA officer. You can see he's your own Martin. Um, society liaison, Margaret Roberts. I've mentioned her already. A networking officer, Dr. Penny Walters. Diversity inclusion. Um, and somebody from the South Australian, uh, the Australians, the Society of Australian Genealogists, that's Ruth Graham. She's the CEO of the, uh, based in Sydney. Um, and then we do have uh, an administrator who is paid uh, and a company secretary who, who is not paid and he uh, acts as the sort of the legal cohesion uh, for all of that. 
So that's the people who are running it. And just to point out that our 50th annual general meeting and conference is on the 11th of May at Wesley's Chapel opposite Bunhill Fields. If any of you happen to be um, over in London or uh, in England, um, around May time, you'd be very welcome. Um, be useful to know if you're coming, so make sure that there is some food for you, provided free. Uh, and uh, so that's to sort of uh, sum up the immediate events. Uh, that's just the legal side at the bottom and the uh, registered office and all that sort of thing. If you want to get hold of our administrator, there she is, Debbie Bradley. You can write to her, Post Office 62 in Sheringham. You can email her, info at familyhistory.federation.com. Or you can telephone her and she is there except during the school run in the afternoon when she's finishing uh, one of her children from the, from the local school. Um, so by all means, if you want to find out more in depth, contact uh, Debbie Bradley. Just to <coughs> remind you, do <coughs> link in via Zoom or whatever technology is being made available on the 15th of November. And that's it from me. And that's just some of the books that I've written. Um, and I have got a couple of copies of one of those. Should anybody want to buy one today? But I really shouldn't be advertising. <laughs> <laughs> but you're more than welcome to come. You can have a look for nothing. <laughs> but thank you very much for your attention. And anybody got any questions? <coughs>